Amen. Wanted to say thank you for <clears throat> allowing me to be gone last week and, and thank you to everyone, especially our our preacher Francis. Uh, we had a great time <clears throat> on our family vacation. And obviously I did not have any frogs while I was there, but I got a frog in my throat. Um, I had a great time. I'm glad to be back with you to talk some more about God's amazing grace. Uh, amen. Francis's children's sermon was awesome. And the yoke and all of that. That was really good. Um, a couple weeks ago, we talked about how some people get hung up and they they think that this free gift of God's grace is free, really free. And they don't, they put it in a box and they say, you know, I'm saved. Maybe the only time they really got close to Jesus was that time in the fifth grade when they got baptized. And they don't realize that Yes, God's grace is a gift, but there's a little more to it. And we've been doing this sermon series to try to talk more about that and figure that out. Uh, for instance, you've heard people say, God loves me just the way I am, right? You've, you maybe said that. God loves me just the way I am. Everybody's comfortable saying that. But what... If you said, God loves me so much that God won't leave me alone. God wants me to change. We're not as comfortable saying that maybe there's something about ourselves that we need to change and that God wants that from us. These are the kinds of things that I want to talk about. There's a, a devotional writer, Christian thinker, preacher named Richard Foster who's talked a lot about God's amazing grace. And in his writings, most of his adult life, he has been encouraging people uh, to grow in the grace of God. And when you read his stuff, it's the kind of things we've been talking about here in church. And it's the same thing I want to talk about today. He, he, his point is grace is more than just forgiveness. And in one of the things that I read recently, he said in most pulpits, there's a disconnect between the good news of Jesus' sacrifice and our calling to become the light of the world. Those two things don't get linked together all. And we hear the same message week after week, uh, and it offers the same remedy and creates the same feelings in us. And sometimes we can get stuck and nothing ever changes. And it's from Foster that I got today's sermon title. Because what he says is, having been saved by grace, people become paralyzed by it. Paralyzed by grace. You've received the free gift of God's grace and suddenly you don't think there's anything else that you need to do. Because if our view of grace is limited to just receiving forgiveness, then we, we cannot really follow Jesus and learn to receive grace like Jesus did, learn to live in grace like Jesus did and learn to depend on upon grace like Jesus did. Jesus never, you know, lived that way. And so we shouldn't live and be paralyzed by grace. And the same issue is going on in the book of Hebrews. And that's the first scripture that I want to read to you today. Some of the same things that he faced, they were facing back then. Hear now this word from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The law of Moses is like a shadow of good things to come. This shadow isn't the good things themselves because it cannot free people from sin by the sacrifices offered year after year. 
If there were worshipers who already have their sins washed away and their conscience made clear, there would not be any need to offer sacrifices. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. What it does, the Hebrew says, is it reminds people of their sins from one year to the next. The word of God for the people of God. That last part is the important part. What all of this ritual does is remind you that you're a sinner. That last line. It reminds people of their sins from one year to the next. Some people call that miserable sinner theology. Miserable sinner theology. Simply put, if I'm told often enough that I'm a miserable sinner, over and over again, I will live that way like a miserable sinner. Even after this amazing grace that Jesus gives to me, I can't get out of the box because of the miserable sinner theology that I've been taught. For a person who follows that way, following Jesus doesn't include the possibility of living and being like him because they are stuck in the miserable sinner box. And it's, it's a problem of our understanding of grace and a problem of our understanding of Jesus. Everything is all jumbled up and messed up. We don't really understand Jesus' sacrifice. We don't understand his building the kingdom. We don't understand Jesus' mission for us if we're stuck being a miserable sinner. I mean, if I was to see Jesus as having done nothing for me except forgiving me for the sins that I committed, and I didn't look at anything else Jesus did, I'd be reducing Jesus to an Old Testament priest that I visited according to the scripture every year. I mean, the scripture said directly, the blood of your sacrifice does not free you from your sin. It only reminds you that you're a sinner. But people think that if I make this offering and I do this, I'll be free. And that's, that's not exactly what the scripture says. Now, I want to talk about this with a, with a modern-day parable. And just in case my old professor is listening, I know I'm getting ready to tell a parable, and it's not really a parable. That Bernard Brandon Scott was my favorite teacher in the seminary, and when we took the parables class, he told us all we had to do to get an A was write a modern-day parable. And if it fit all the criteria, we didn't have to do any other work the whole semester. Of course, all of us worked very, very hard and tried and tried and tried, but none of us were able to create the parable. Here's my effort this week. See if I can get an A. So, two high school students each received a prestigious, prestigious scholarship to Harvard University. Full rides, every possible expense paid. Parents say amen. I know. If every expense were paid. Both of these kids were very, very bright. They had a full ride. Every expense paid to Harvard University. And they each thought, because they were intimidated by the reputation of Harvard, they each thought, I don't deserve to be here. Now, one student studied day and night she gave it all she had the big city was nearby and the other student didn't study as much as the first student but the first student was working and working and working the other student was going to parties visiting things by midterm the first student was making b's and c's in her classes and the other student was failing every class and was placed on academic probation. The first student had a 3.0 GPA after that first semester. But 
the second student was out. Which of these two students took hold of the opportunity given to them? Well, of course, it was the first student, right? Humble and hardworking. And what did they say about the second student? The second student had thrown away that opportunity. That's what we all would say about the second student. Now, imagine for a moment that the grace of God is like a full ride to Harvard University. The grace of God is like a full ride to Harvard University. Beyond expectation, every expense paid. It is a life-changing opportunity. Anyone watching these two students would conclude that the student who flunked out had wasted the opportunity. Scholarship to Harvard was a gift of grace. But the truth was, the truth was, you still had to work for it. The scholarship was a gift of grace, but the truth was, you still had to work for it. God's grace is something like this parable. God does for us what we could not possibly do for ourselves. What is beyond our reach is joyfully paid in full by Jesus Christ. But the work is just getting started. The work is just beginning. What would, you know, why would we squander the possibility of new birth in Christ? Like the student who received a full ride to Harvard, we need to receive the grace of God for what it is. It's a calling to live a new life right now. When you're born into God's family, you're also born into the family business. And if you didn't know that, then this is the, the important point in the sermon. When you are born into God's family, you're born into the family business. God's grace doesn't just wipe away our sin. God's grace asks us to join in the work of the kingdom. The Apostle Paul talked about this uh, in his letter to the church at Corinth. He talked about the work that we're going to do. And what did he say? He said you had to have great endurance. You're going to face troubles, hardships, and distress. You might get beat up. You might get thrown in jail. There might be a riot. You might have to do some hard work. And you might have sleepless nights and you might go hungry. Paul described for people this work. And what was all that work for? It was in order to share what Paul had been given with all the other people. He did all that hard work. Paul had no trouble making a connection between grace and effort. And if we're students of Jesus, we need grace so we can grow. Uh, grace makes it possible for us to stop yo-yoing around in our lives between sin and forgiveness, sin and forgiveness. Instead, grace shows us the destiny we have in Jesus Christ. What I believe that, that we can learn today is the deeper side of this grace that we're talking about. New birth in Jesus should be followed by growth into the image of Jesus. The deeper side of grace is that when we, we begin to join the family business, we will also begin to take on the family likeness. We begin to walk, talk, and act like Jesus. And I want to get to where the children's sermon was on that scripture. I want to read it to you about the yoke that you so wonderfully illustrated to the kids. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 has this revelation in it. Jesus invites anyone who would follow him to come under his instruction and learn this way of life. This is that scripture. Let me read it. 
If you're tired from carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. Take the yoke I give you, put it on your shoulders and learn from me. What did it say? Take the yoke and put it on your shoulders and come and learn from me. I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest. This yoke is easy to bear, and this burden is light. The word of God for the people of God. God. Jesus said, take up your work, the yoke. We're going to spread the work out, this kingdom work that we're doing together, and you will learn from me. That image was very common in Jesus' day. And oh, by the way, I heard John Leeds whispering a minute ago, you forgot the yoke on the airplane since you had them jumping up and down out of the airplane. I love that because without that in the airplane, there's no way one person could control it. There's a yoke in there that controls the wheel. And just like that yoke controls the airplane, so too all of us working together build that kingdom and we learn from jesus example we learn from jesus as we work together over and over again because grace is about more than knowing it's about being when 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 we get that gift from god our strength is added to the strength of all of our friends and neighbors who are also getting rest, carrying the yoke together, learning from Jesus. If God wants to give me the grace to be more like Jesus, and if all it takes from me is just a little bit of effort on my part, then count me. I mean, that's it. That's the life that I want. That's the life that I have chosen. It's how we take the yoke. It's how we position ourselves to learn from Jesus. And it's how we stop being paralyzed by grace. And we start participating in building the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to have our hymn of invitation for the healing of the nations in a moment. It's number uh, 668 uh, in the hymn. But I want to issue this invitation today. If there are any among us who would like to make their confession of faith and pick up the yoke we're talking about today and learn with all of us, we would invite you to do that. Come forward as we sing together. If there are any who would transfer their membership from another congregation, we would also welcome you to come forward and be greeted as we stand and sing together. Please stand.